Okay, so we're going to be going through section 2.2 today, so just that section uh, that you're looking at right here. And we'll kind of like get to a definition of limits in just a second, but for right now, we're going to start out just by considering a function right here. Okay, specifically f of x equals x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1. And we want to first describe just what's the domain of f of x. So volunteers, what would the domain of this function be? So, yeah, Bryce? Negative infinity to 1, union 1, 2, infinity. Okay? And so why did you exclude the value of positive 1 there? Right, and in fact, in this specific case, we're actually going to end up with 0 over 0 when we plug the plug in um, 1. Okay, so um, 1, or f of 1, I guess, is, uh, we'll say, indeterminate form, right? Okay, again, we could say undefined if it was a number over 0, but since it's f, uh, since it gets 0 over 0, that is indeterminate form, okay, indeterminate form. Okay, well, let's take a look at the graph of this. Now, I don't expect you guys to uh, graph this by hand, so let's get our graphing calculators here, and let's graph this thing, okay. So, I'll put this up here and type it in, x to the third minus 1 divided by x minus 1, okay. And so when I graph it, do you guys get something like that? Anyone get this when you graph it? Anyone get that when you graph it? You got it? Okay, because you shouldn't. Because, because you should have parentheses around your numerator, okay? So make sure you're putting parentheses around your numerator, parentheses around your denominator, okay? <laughs> Trick question. There is what it should look like, okay? There is what it should look like. Okay, yes. Do you have other stuff in your like y equals, or do you have your stat plots on maybe? Oh yeah. So yeah. So arrow up to the the stat plot that's highlighted, and then hit enter to toggle it off. And now it should graph. Okay. Yep, you're welcome. And sometimes it's like when your calculator's in your backpack or something like that gets jostled around, and buttons get pressed. And, you know, it's a kind of like butt dialing, but with your calculator. Um, anyway. All right, so there's the graph, so we'll sketch that. We'll sketch that. Kind of looks like a parabola, which is interesting because you have that x cubed there and stuff, but kind of looks like a parabola. So we'll graph a, sketch it. Now you'll notice the calculator is missing something here. Bryce just said that at 1, we should be excluding that from the, from the domain, but it looks like the calculator graphs it. We will put a little circle there. Okay, just kind of, so there, there's 1, I'll put the hole, and it goes like that. Okay. And in fact, if, if you use your graphing calculator and try to evaluate this graph at 1, remember to do that. You press second, trace, and then value. We can type in the given x value one to evaluate. So if I type in 1, you can see that it gives me a y equals blank. Okay? So that's a good indication there's a problem there, really a hole. And so we would you know, then ignore, or we would have to graph the hole there. So. Okay. But then, of course, we want to know, as mathematicians, right? We, we're not just happy with like, all right, well, you know, there's a hole at 1. Right? We want to be able to say more than that because, sure, we can't evaluate f at 1, but, man, the behavior really close to 1 on either side looks like we can approach some sort of value there. right? And so we can, let's do that using our table. So we want to ask the question, you know, what happens as that x value approaches 1? Right? We can't get to 1. We can't be at 1. It's indeterminate. But let's see what happens as we approach. So we'll go to our table. Okay, and if you haven't done this already, I'm going to recommend or suggest here that you press second window and change your independent variable from automatically filling in to asking you. Okay, so again, second window will allow you to type into your table what x values you want it to evaluate. Okay, especially for this section right here because we're going to be doing a lot of like table <coughs> stuff, so it'll be helpful. So switching your independent variable from auto to ask, 
now has our table here. If you have like a bunch of numbers in your table, you can clear those up by hitting delete. And we'll just type in some of these things. So if x is 0.75, we get 2.313, I guess I'll say, if I round that to the nearest thousandths. Okay. Type in 0.9, I get 2.71. Type in 0.999, I get 2.997. Okay. If I type in 1, error, right, which is... Shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be a problem. Of course, we get an error there. It's undefined, so um, let's put a question mark. And then 1.001, 1.1, okay, so 3.003, there, 3.31, 1.25 is about 3.813. And then 1.5, about 4.75. Okay. So what do we notice is happening to the value of our function as the value of our independent variable there approaches 1. As we approach 1 from the left, as x approaches from the left here, it looks like our values are approaching what? 3, right? And as we approach 1 from the right, it looks like our values are approaching... Three, okay. So we might say then that as x approaches one, f of x moves arbitrarily close to three. Right? X moves arbitrarily close to three. Okay. Keep in mind though, f of one still indeterminate. Okay. F of one is still indeterminate. In this case, right, we get 0 over 0. But as we approach 1, f of x, we can say, moves closer and closer to 3. Okay? What I mean by arbitrarily close there is that as close as I need to get to the number 3 to convince you that it's, that it's 3, right? So, so like one of you guys might say, oh, Mr. Whitmire, that's not, you know, I'm not convinced here. 2.997, it's still off by 3 thousandths, right? You know, I would need you to show me that it would be off by 3 millionths or something like that. Well, we can get that close to kind of show you that it's approaching 3, right? You might say, this is not approaching 3, but we can get that much closer if we need to. As close as you want to get, okay, as close as you want to get without actually getting there, because we can't actually get there, as close as you want to get, we can get that close, okay? So that's what arbitrarily means. You can get as close as you want to get, okay? You can just come up with an arbitrary, you know, decision about how close you want to be. We can get that close, okay? This concept, this concept that we just kind of explored here is the idea of a limit, okay? So we'll define a limit here using like mathematical terms and things, okay? And then we'll also show you the notation as well. So if f of x becomes arbitrarily close to a single number l, f of x becomes arbitrarily close to a single, single number, L, as x approaches C. From either side. And that's, a, that's key, too. We'll see some examples of that, right? We, had to, we analyzed both from the left-hand side, from val values lower than 1, we were approaching 3. We also evaluated it from the right-hand side. Value is approaching 1, but the function was approaching 3 as well. Okay, we'll look later at what happens, what we, what, you know, what we should say, or what, what is true when if the left-hand side and the right-hand side disagree. Right? We'll look at that later. Um, but for right now, you just they both must approach the same thing if we have a limit there. Um, so if f of x becomes arbitrarily close to a single number l as x approaches c from either side, the limit of f of x, okay, as x approaches c, is l, okay? So if a function becomes arbitrarily close to a single number, a single value l, as x is approaching c from either side, the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l, the limit. And so that's how we define the limit, okay?
that limit. And so then the symbols for that, the notation is this. We abbreviate limit, which is L-I-M, as X approaches C of F of X equals L. Okay, there's the notation for it. And again, we read this as, if you want to you know, write that down to the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals L. That's how we read that. Okay, that's how we read that. Okay, questions on any of that? Moving on then. Okay. So, example one. Now we're using our notation. Okay, so we're asked to find the limit as x approaches zero of this function, okay, by completing the table, and then we're going to graph it to kind of verify that it's so. Okay, we're going to kind of graph it to verify that it is so. All right. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and do this here. All right, we need to approach zero. So we're going to approach zero. I'm going to put that zero smack in the middle, right, because we have to approach zero both from the left-hand side and from the right-hand side. Okay. To approach zero from the right, that's not too bad. We'll just do stuff like 0 0.001 maybe, um, 0 0.01, 0 0.1. You can put like a 1 there too if you wanted to, something like that. Okay. And then from the left-hand side, we want to be a little bit careful here because now we're dealing with negatives. Okay. The next closest value to zero, we'll do like negative 0 0.001. Right? Then negative 0 0.01, negative 0 0.1, and then negative 1. So be careful here. It's not just like they're not just like um, you know, in the same order. Watch, watch, you know, watch your numeric order there. You want to make sure that these numbers are getting closer and closer to zero from the left hand side, right? So negative one is further, but then negative point one's closer, 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 and then from the right hand side, same idea. Okay. Typically, I don't find students having too much difficulty on the right hand side. Eh, sometimes, if there's negative numbers in there, that can happen too. Okay. So, but anyway. All right. So let's do this here again using our calculators. Go ahead and fill that in, and let's see here. I'll I'll do it too. Okay. Yeah, make sure you type the thing in your calculator correctly. I'm going to delete out all these old ones. So there's my table there. Okay. I originally put 1.999 here, but then I realized with rounding it would really be 2.000. So I wanted to again model good, um, you know, what I'm telling to you guys. And I, I told you that as we go in this class, if you're going to come up with decimals, you want to round to three decimal places, okay? Or you can truncate again, just cutting off after three decimal places. Whichever you choose to do, be consistent with that. Okay, so I was not being consistent here. I truncated originally, so I'm going to make that rounding. Again, just to have good practices in there. Okay? So, based on this information, we can say that the limit as x approaches 0 of x over the square root of x plus 1 minus 1 is going to equal what? 2, right? From the left, it's approaching 2. From the right, it's approaching 2. And so, we would say... 
Okay. And then, oops, I don't know why I just did that. Let's, gra let's sketch the graph of it here to kind of verify things. All right, and so when I graph, sketch the graph here, it looks kind of like a square root, right? Um, and we want to approach zero. And certainly if we look here, there's, you know, y coordinate one and there's y coordinate two as we kind of cross that y axis. So yeah, it looks like we have a y value of two there. Okay, we'll kind of sketch that there. Looks like it starts at negative one, one. Yep, so it does start at like negative one, one. And then we'll say it goes through the two there, but it's a whole. So it looks something like that. Okay. I'd like to do one more here, and I think I'd rather just, I just want you to have to do the, the table setup. Okay, so I want to just squeeze one in here just to make sure we're okay. So, so for you guys to try here, and again, just set up the table. Okay, just all you gotta do, you don't have to evaluate the table, but I just set it up, I just wanna make sure we're okay with that. So the limit as x approaches negative two of x squared minus three x plus two over uh, x plus two. So again, just set up the table here. So I'm gonna give you some an f, x and f of x, and I don't know, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So we did four on either side there, and I'll put the, Negative two there. Two, three, four. So again, just fill in this top part of the table there, just so that I, you don't have to even fill in the function um, for me. I'm just interested in just setting up the table. That's all I want you to do right here, just set up the table. Okay, so again, we're approaching negative two, so write your numbers that would go in here for the x values at the top of that table. Okay. <clears throat> Approach that negative two from the left and from the right hand side. Okay, so the setup for your table should look something like this, okay? And I asked you to set up this specific one because it's the limit as x approaches negative two. And so we wanna be careful about um, which numbers are to the left of negative two on the number line, right? Which numbers are to the left of negative two, which numbers are to the right of negative two on a number line, right? Negative two, excuse me, negative 2.001 is actually a smaller value, right, than negative two, right? Because it's more negative, okay? So it's actually to the left of that negative two. And then negative 1.999 is actually on the right of that negative two because again, that's a bigger value. It's less negative than negative two, all right? So negatives can throw people off a little bit, right? That's the reverse of what it would be if these were all positive, right? If this was positive two, sorry, if this was positive two, it'd be a one point, not positive 1.99 over here, positive 2.001 over here. So just be careful with that. That's all I'll say. Okay, um, if you actually type this into your calculator then, and look at this, okay, we get an interesting behavior here that, well, the left-hand side seems to be getting more and more negative, the right-hand side seems to be getting more and more positive, okay, and so um, we'll come back to that idea in a second here, okay, we'll come back to that in a second. Anyway, 
So that's not the only way we're going to be doing calculus, right? Because certainly there are non-calculator sections of the test, and uh, you won't have a calculator to do this kind of stuff, and we're not going to expect you to plug those numbers in and you know um, find those like little tiny uh, values and things, OK? So our three-pronged approach we're going to be using here, the numeric approach, which is what we're doing right now, using a table of values, OK? This is like a tool in your toolbox when it comes to finding a limit, right? So say, for example, that you're out in the wild, right? And I'm teaching you all these different skills and stuff like that, OK? The majority of the work that we're going to be doing with limits is going to be some strategies we'll learn a little bit later, this analytic approach, right? Using algebra or calculus, all right? But if you're in the wild using this analytic approach and you realize that I don't know how to evaluate this limit, you can always fall back on your calculator, OK, to use a table of values to try and evaluate that limit, right? Or you can use the calculator to help, help you, you know, check your answers to see if it's right, OK? So don't forget this approach. The main um, chunk of our time is going to be spent with the analytic approach. But don't forget this numeric approach. It's a legit strategy to use if you need to. And of course, there's the graphical approach as well, which we'll be examining here in just a little bit, OK? All right. So, um, and again, one and two, they're means of approximating a limit. So just be aware of that too. Analytic approach, we'll get like, you know, we'll be able to evaluate you know, exactly kind of stuff. Here we're kind of like saying, eh, yeah, it's, you know, like close enough to a certain number. So, all right, let's graph something here. So now we're going to graph x squared minus four. Okay, this we don't need a calculator for. Right, we don't need a calculator for this. Our parent function is x squared. And it's shifted which direction? Right. Down four. Careful. Down four. One, two, three, four. And then there's going to be our new vertex. And OK, so then we'll go over one and up one there. And then let's see, at two, it'll be four minus four, so zero there. And at negative two, it'll be zero. And we'll just kind of go with that, OK? And then at three, it'll be nine. So one, two, three, four, five, okay. And they get three, five. So thank goodness for symmetry here. All right. Okay. So there's our graph, there's our sketch. Okay. So looking at our graph here, right, we want to evaluate the limit as x approaches three of x squared minus four. All right, and so we'll approach three here. So here's the x value, one, two, there's three, okay? As we approach that three from the left, right, from values less than the three on the function here, what is the value of the function that we're approaching here? It's gonna be, yeah, five, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? It's the height of five there. So we're approaching five from the left, and if we come from the right here, from the right moving towards that x value three, we're also approaching five. And so we'll say the limit is five. You can also do a table of values there if you wanted to, but it's not necessary. OK? All right. What is f of 3? 5. Whoa, mind blown. OK, so here we can actually evaluate the function at its limit, right? So the limit as x approaches 3 is 5. The value of the function is 5, right? The previous limits that we've done, the limit and the function value did not agree, right? In the very first one, we could not evaluate the function at 1, right? It was indeterminate form, but we could find the limit, OK? Likewise here for the first example, right? We could evaluate the limit of the function. We could see what happens as you approach 0. But if you actually plug 0 in, it would not work there, right? You got a hole there, too. Okay. And so here, we're actually able to evaluate it, OK? What is different about this function? than the previous two. What's unique or different about the function we just observed here, right, than the previous two that maybe is related to why the function and the limit are the same thing here? What, do you, what, what, what did this have? What did the other one have? Yes, Cindy? There's no hole. OK, right? These functions are discontinuous at certain locations. This function, continuous everywhere. Right? One smooth curve. And so the limit and the function end up being the same value no matter where you look. All right? Let's try another example, though. Piecewise. Good stuff. Okay? So piecewise functions, we've got to be able to graph these. 
All right. So let's sketch the graph of this. Okay. Hopefully we're feeling pretty confident about piecewise functions, or a little bit, at least a little bit more confident now, all right? So we want to graph this thing. Let's see. The function is equal to 1 whenever x is not equal to 2. So we'll say there's the x value of 2. We'll say there's the y value of 1. So wherever it's not 2. So I'm going to put an open circle at 2, and everything else is going to be 1. So it'll just kind of look like this, a nice horizontal line going this way. A nice horizontal line going that way. Okay. I know that looks like a some weird tick mark there, but it's supposed to just be one. Okay. It's supposed to be the value of one that's going through there. Okay. At zero, at the specific point of zero, or sorry, at the at the specific point of x equals two, the y value is zero. And so we're gonna have a point, a single point right there at 2. So there's the graph of that piecewise function. Okay, there's the graph of that piecewise function. Um, just see something here real quick. I don't know if it's going to work really well. Um, I didn't show this to you guys um, when I um, earlier, and I probably won't show you just now because it's not super good with this with this kind of thing. But you can graph piecewise functions in your graphing calculator. Um, okay, yeah, it doesn't really show up that well because the calculator doesn't do good for points. I'll show you how it later when we come across a better piecewise function because this one's not very really good for it. But there's our graph. Okay, first question we've got here: the limit as x approaches negative one of f of x. All right, well, negative one is over here. So what do we say that is there? What do you guys think that's going to be? As we approach negative 1 for our function here, as we approach negative 1 from the left, and as we approach it from the right, what's the value of that limit going to be? 1, right? It's positive value, positive 1 there. OK, no problem. Okay. What about the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x? So here again is the x value of 2. As we approach 2 from the left, as we approach 2 from the right, what's the value of the function approaching? 1, right? From either side, we're approaching 1, from the left, from the right. What is f of 2 at 2? What's the value of the function? Zero. Zero. Okay, and again, that's according to our piecewise function. Okay? So again, we see this behavior showing up. Now the limit and the function disagree. And we see that discontinuity that Simeon pointed out in the previous, in the previous um, graphs and stuff like that. Okay? So key thing to remember here, the existence or non-existence of a function at x equals c has no bearing on the existence of the limit of f of x as x approaches c. Okay? Just because, and, it, and so if you're given just a function here and you're told the function exists at c, that does not mean the limit necessarily exists. If you're given a limit and said the limit of the function exists as x, as x approaches c, that does not mean the function exists at c. Okay? So the limit and the value of the function are not the same thing. Okay? They don't always guarantee each other's existence. Okay, so keep that in mind. Notice here, we're not specifying that f is continuous, and that's why we can get away with saying that. If we were to specify the function's continuous, then yes, the value of the function does bear on the existence of the limit. But we're not specifying f is continuous, it's just the function. Okay, so that means, that means it's not necessarily continuous. All right, right here, evaluate the following or a state that does not exist. So I would like you guys to go ahead and give this one a try here. So go ahead, example four. Try it on your own, see what you can come up with. I'll give you a few minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll gather back together here. Okay. So try number four using the graph. Okay, using that graph. So A through H there, try to evaluate that using the graph. <coughs> okay, and I'll kind of walk around and help as necessary. by me if you like want to check or something.
this side. As we approach you, we're going to go down this way, right? Yeah. Right. As we approach three from this side, we're going to go up this way. So it's going to be a guy with a horse skating stuff like this. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I guess there will be situations, Clayton, where you won't be able to determine whether it exists or not, potentially. But in our class, it'll either be it'll exist, and you'll come up with the value, or it does not exist, and you'll say it does not exist. Indeterminate means you literally can't make up your mind whether it exists or not, kind of thing. Deter you know, does not exist means it does not exist. OK, let's go over some things. Let's check this out here. So let's go to. Daniel, Daniel, you got one for you got a letter A answer for us here, sir. You said negative three. Uh, did you mean positive three? There you go. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay, yes, positive three there. Positive three. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Let's go to Madison B. Madison B, go ahead. I think we only have one Madison, don't we? No, we have two Madisons. That's right, Madison B. All right, if you don't mind, Madison B. Uh, letter B, what did you get for f of negative 2? Four. four. Okay, four. All right, looks good. Again, evaluating up through there, through the point. Good job. Oop. Let me go to my, there we go. All right, um, Madison H now for letter C. What did you get for the limit there? Zero. Zero. Okay. Uh, let's go to Morgan for letter D. What did you get for f of 1? Zero. Okay, very good. Uh, how about Clayton for letter E? Does not exist. Does not exist. You can, um, yeah, write that out. Does not exist. How do you determine that it does not exist there, Clayton? What kind of clues you in that uh, it didn't exist? I mean, it was going to either, it was like, it looks like it's approaching infinity and Okay, very good. So yes, there, there. In fact, we so in one case we could say the limits the, from the left and from the right will disagree. They're not the same value, and so the limit does not exist overall there. Okay. Alternatively, you can say because we're approaching infinity, also the limit would not exist there too. So yep, good job. All right, well, let's go to um, Katie. What do you say there, Katie, for letter F? Undefined. Undefined. Okay. And how would you determine that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's no part of the function there, right? You could also say does not exist there. That would be fine as well. Um, all right, letter G. I'll take uh, volunteers for letter G. Volunteers for letter G. Luke, what you got? Is it zero? Is it zero? Okay, I believe. Yes, it is. So how did you evaluate that? What did you do here? Um, well, f of zero is negative one. Okay. Okay, so f of 0, so we're, like, we're evaluating the limit as x approaches 0. So as we approach 0 of the function, we're approaching negative 1. So that takes care of the innermost piece, right? But then, then we're approaching negative 1 for the outer piece, right? It'll be f of negative 1 like that, and so it's approaching the y value of 0 there. Yep. Okay. Okay. 
And then the last question here, number uh, 20, or number, letter, number H, letter H, sorry. Let's go to Zoe. So Zoe, for letter H, what were the values of C where the limit as X approaches C equals 3? Oh, very good. You got both of them. Excellent. Yes. C equals negative 2. C equals 4. Don't forget this piece over here, right, where the function is approaching a value of 3 from both sides. So negative 2 and 4. Okay. Well done. Questions on any of those? Okay, I know we kind of blew through them, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. No? All right, moving on then. Okay, <clears throat> so as we have seen, right, some limits do not exist. Some limits do not exist. So let's take a look at some situations, some instances, okay, where they do not exist. Okay. And we have three different examples because we kind of have like uh, three different uh, flavors of ways that limits cannot exist. All right. So first one we'll look at is this function absolute value of x over x. So let's graph it using our calculators here. Okay. All right. I'll graph this thing. And there it is. Absolute value of x over x. Now, let's try and make some sense of this graph here first because that is pretty funky, right? But it actually um, makes some good sense here. Let's think about how we would graph this if we had to graph it by hand, right? We would pick some x values, plug those x values in, and then obviously graph their max and y values. So let's think about this. Any negative x value that we pick, okay? The numerator is going to become the positive version. So let's just say we pick negative 3. It'll be absolute value of negative 3. It becomes positive 3 over negative 3. 3 over negative 3 is negative 1, right? And in fact, if we pick any negative x value here, we're going to take the absolute value of the x value so it's positive on top, but divide it by its negative counterpart, and so it'll always be negative 1. And so in fact, no matter what negative x value we pick, we're always going to get negative 1 because we're taking that x value, taking the absolute value and dividing it by itself. Compare that with the positive x values here, right? If we pick any positive x value, it's going to stay positive and then divide by itself so it becomes positive 1. So it shouldn't surprise us that we go from negative 1 to the positive 1 there. At 0, what's going to be our result? Undefined or even indeterminate form potentially here because 0 over 0 kind of thing, right? And so that's where we get this like weird jump. All right, so I'll sketch the graph here real quick. Okay, so while I know absolute values can be a little intimidating sometimes to, you know, think about and consider, evaluate, um, you know, sometimes we can make some sense of it like that. So open circle at zero, and then shooting to the right like that. Open circle at negative one, and then going back to the left like that. <coughs> okay. So... What's the limit as x approaches 0 of absolute value of x over x? Does not exist. Okay. What's, what would be a good reason here? What would be a good reason here, a good justification for why we could say that? Sean, what do you say? Okay. So we, when, as we approach 0, okay, from the left and from the right, the values disagree. Right, okay. So, um, and again, I'm going to write one version of it. You know, I'm not saying this is the only way to write it, but I just think it's, you know, it's thorough. It covers all the bases. Maybe it's not the most efficient, but you get the idea. So as we approach um, zero, and you can use the numbers here, zero from the left, um, absolute value of x over x, approaches negative 1. As we approach 0 from the right, absolute value of x over x approaches positive 1. Since the um, values disagree, 
okay, the function does, or the limit does, limit as x, the limit as x approaches zero of absolute value of x over x does not exist. Okay, something like that. Could I have written that differently? Absolutely. You know, there's other ways to do it that would be potentially, you know, um, acceptable and stuff like that. But there's a nice thorough way of saying it, at least for when you, you want to look back at this and kind of get a, you know, a good solid understanding of why that would be. Okay, I think that should be good at least. Okay, does not exist. All right. Um, and again, I write this also because in, in calculus on the AP test, right, the, our goal, right, our, our main kind of like big um, thing we're looking for at the end, look, look to at the end of the class, right, um, you will sometimes need to not only show work but also provide justification, like written justification, okay? Sometimes, you know, it can be wordy, sometimes it's just a sentence, but something we need to be ready to do as well, not only to do the work but to explain why we do the work. All right. Moving on, 1 over x squared. Let's graph this thing. Take a look at it. Okay, so we get this interesting kind of behavior right there. Just going to sketch that graph. Right. And so what would you say the limit is here? As what would we say the limit is as x approaches zero of one over x squared? What would we say the limit is here as we approach zero for this function? What would we say? All right, Sean, what would you say? Does not exist. That is the best answer, okay? We might be tempted to say, but Mr. Widmeyer, it's approaching the same thing from the left-hand side and from the right-hand side. Both of those left-hand and right-hand sides are approaching positive infinity. Shouldn't we just say the answer is positive infinity? And yes, it can be helpful to know that you are approaching infinity. But the idea of a limit is that it is limited. And the idea of infinity is that it is unlimited. It keeps going, right? And so a limit, by definition, needs to be finite not infinite, okay? So if you have a limit that is approaching infinity, that limit does not exist, does not exist, okay? So as we approach zero from either side, the function 1 over x squared approaches infinity. Actually, I, can just, I think I can just use the infinity symbol there. The limit does not exist. Okay, Just like Lindsay Lohan said at the end of Mean Girls. We'll actually be doing that limit, I think, but later in calculus. Later in calculus. I think we will have all the skills necessary later in calculus. Okay, so I don't know if that was, you can cross that off your bucket list, you know. All right, last one here, last one. Limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 1 over x. Okay, so, so I guess different flavors here, right? Here, the limit does not exist because the left-hand and right-hand behavior are dis in not agreement, okay? They're disagreeing with each other. Here, the limit does not exist, not because the left-hand and right-hand behaviors disagree, they agree, but they go to infinity. Okay, so left hand and right hand limits um, are different. Um, the limit goes to infinity, so therefore it does not exist. And then here's a weird one. Here is a weird one. Okay, so we're going to graph this. Make sure your mode is set to radians. Okay, so we'll graph this little thing. All right, I'll zoom in here some so you can see it better. All right, so there is the graph of sine of 1 over x. And at first glance, you're like, eh, that doesn't look too bad. Okay, let's say it kind of like goes down and then comes up and then, I don't know, does go, maybe goes back down and comes back up again or something like that. Okay. It's like, how, what, what's going on here? Well, if I zoom in, so I'm going to do zoom, and there's different zoom tools here. You can use this literally zoom in. I sometimes like to use Z-Box. If you've never used Z-Box before, you um, use your arrows to move this little like cursor around, and then you can hit enter, and that'll drop a point, and then you can now move your arrows again and create this 
box around the thing that you want to zoom in on. And then hit enter and it'll zoom in right on that thing. Okay, so wow, we're getting some interesting behavior there, right? It's kind of like messy, so we'll try it again here and see what's happening. Okay. Okay, zoom in on this again. Ugh. Okay. And as we zoom in, as we zoom in, uh, the sine wave is going to just get more and more compressed and compacted uh, to the point where as we approach from the left and as we approach from the right, it's not going to be clear what specific value that we are at, okay, where we are exactly. Okay, so how can we best sketch this? Here's, here's what I will give you is my best take on something like this. Um, we're going to go like, so if I go back to zoom six, okay, we'll do something like this where I will go maybe like all right, down and then up and then and then up and then back down. Okay, just like that. That's the best I can do for you guys because that's what we're trying to show here. Okay, and so this behavior results in the limit not existing either because we are like oscillating so um, quickly between or through the zero there, or as we approach zero, the values are jumping between negative and one so quickly we there's no way to tell exactly what it is. It's, it, there's no single value it's approaching. It's like jumping around between negative one and one um, really quickly there. So um, as we approach zero from either side. the value of the function oscillates, and that's like the actual like word, you know, used and stuff like that, um, between negative one and one. The limit does not exist. Okay. 98% of the limits that you're going to evaluate. If they don't exist, it's going to be one of these two. Rarely will you, see, will you see this, but this is one that we are responsible for, so that's why I present it to you. Okay, so common types of behavior associated with the non-existence of a limit. f of x approaches a blank from the right side of c than from the left side of c. A different number. Okay. And again, I'm not saying like you have to write this specific one, but that idea, right? A different number, different value if you wanted to. Okay. So that was the first one we saw, this example up here. Different value from left and right. Number two, f of x increases or decreases to infinity or to negative infinity, or we can also say without bound. That's what I'm going to have here because that's what I have from before. So, But again, you can say to infinity or negative infinity, right? To infinity. And then finally, f of x blanks between two fixed values as x approaches c, and there's the oscillates. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Any questions? All right. That's all. So your assignment is on Google Classroom. I suggest you get started on it. All right. Um, I'll be around to help you. But there you go. All right. Yes, you may.